Welcome to Malcolm Reed's How to Barbecue Right, a podcast where we talk about barbecue, share recipes, and discuss all things delicious. And now, here's your host, Malcolm and Rochelle Reed. Hey, welcome back to How to Barbecue Right. I'm Malcolm Reed, and before we get started today, I got some exciting news. We got a brand new sponsor, and I'm just going to tell you about it, Shell. Uh, it's Schwank Grills. How do you spell that? S C H W A N K Grills. It's real easy. But <laughs> let me let me tell you about Schwank Grills. It's a portable 1500 degree cooking machine, Shell. It uses infrared heat, which is perfect for cooking steaks in perfection or to perfection in only three minutes. So you can cook a ribeye steak in three minutes on this thing. The Schwank Grill cooks just like those fancy 1500 degree grills that they use. At steakhouses like the Denver Palm, Morton's, even Roos Chris. I know you've been to Roos Chris and Morton's. Mm, I love it. They cook some good. Uh, you get that nice sear on the outside. That's what I like about those. <laughs> but you can cook just about anything from steak, lobster, even pizza. They have accessories available like pizza stones and stuff like that for these swank grills. They're giving our listeners uh, $150 off a new purchase of one. So go check out their website. You can find the link and the code in our description. Welcome aboard Schwank Grills. That is S-C-H, Wank. <laughs> Grills. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's a catchy name, Schwank. <laughs> so, Shell, how are you today? Joined by my lovely wife, as always, and Tyler on the board. Doing great. Hope Wonderful. You know. Fresh a week back. From vacation. Yes. This was a tough week for me. <laughs> it was a been, tough week. You had I, multiple tantrums, <laughs> a couple breakdowns. I have been thinking all week about going back to the Caribbean. Because we just, ba- I mean, the Bahamas is barely the Caribbean. Yeah. Like, it's pretty much Miami South. Yeah. So it's not as hot as I like it, but it's February. So, I mean, the, what would we get? Some 86 degrees? No, yeah, probably got the 86 one day there. Which with the had, sun out, it's pre- I got bur- I got burnt up. I mean, I got had, me a little sun. We had a uh, several warm days, and then the wind kind of there was a storm yeah. blew in, and the wind came in, and it got a little cold. But all in all, we had a great time. It's great to to reset a little there in the winter, and now it's ready for spring. I'm ready for spring. I'm ready to go back. I'm ready for spring. I'm ready for crawfish bowls. I'm ready for cookouts. I'm ready for sitting in a lawn chair. Outside, having a beer. Going to the creek. Oh. Put your toes in the water. All that, yeah. All that. The weather kind of faked us out the other day. It was like, it felt like it was like 80 yeah. degrees for a couple of days. Then now it's been like 40 degrees, 50 degrees. Yeah, it's still, it was a little chilly this morning. I got I got long sleeves on. Yeah. I had to put my shorts back up. I, mean, I was getting <laughs> used to them. <laughs> that uh, fake spring. Yeah. I took wooden pair of pants with me to the Bahamas. Only wore them a couple times to those dinners where you had to. The rest of the time, it was shorts, swim trunks, flops, Crocs. Can you imagine traveling for a week and only taking one pair of pants? Is that your traveling pants too? No, 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 no. You technically had two pairs. Well, I I wore jeans because it was cold when we left. So I wear jeans, but when I get there, I take them off and I put them in the closet and I don't wear them again until I go back home. So I, I, I can get two flights out of a pair of jeans. But the other pants, you had to take some dress pants. So I just took some khakis and I'd I'd put them on, go to dinner. As soon as we get, dinner was over, I'd go back and put shorts on. <laughs> <laughs> Malcolm's become a master packer. He wants to get everything in carry uh, on. Carry on. Heck yeah, I don't want to have to check nothing. I'm so we've been doing this for several years. I've figured out what I I, I make notes in my phone. What, what did I use? What did I not use? Did you take anything this time you didn't use? Yeah, an extra pair of slides that I didn't need. Um. Yeah, I wouldn't have took closed-toed shoes if it hadn't been for those restaurants where I needed those pants. I'd save me some room. I think I, did I put those in your bag. Yeah, and, and yeah. your Crocs. So technically, you yeah. didn't get it all in a carry-on. I pretty much did. <laughs> it pretty count. much did. You don't need a whole lot. Like for a week, I mean, I need two swim trunks because like, like I let one pair dry <laughs> while I wear the other pair. And then the next day, I just swap them back out. So, it, I mean, it works. It works. Couple t-shirts, couple t-shirts, couple, couple collared couple shirts, couple collared shirts, and that's it. Some toiletries, and so this week you released a short rib mac and cheese. Oh, it was so good! It was really good. That one, I don't know if you could tell in that video when I tried it. That was that was real. <laughs> that was real. It put me in another place. Are you saying sometimes it's fake? 
I mean, sometimes, you know, you got to, oh, it's so good or whatever. <laughs> yeah, is it really that good? I mean, most of the time it's pretty good. Yeah, but, most of it's pretty good. But it ain't that good. That was that good. Like that one, you can't eat that every day. If you ate short ribs and mac and cheese every day, oh, it'd kill you quick probably. And your mac and cheese, you make a, a pretty rich, creamy, yeah. cheesy mac and cheese. It's different than the one you make. Like So yeah. we've done, and I've done your, I kind of stole your recipe and did a, like a, a mac and cheese for the smoker or whatever. And so it's a that's a mac and cheese casserole. I, I don't care what good. anybody says, that's casserole. The way I like and I like I like real creamy, a little runny. I like it pasta and sauce. You know? And that's kind of mac and cheese. Yeah, that's mac and so like if I'm serving dinner, like it's part of the entree, it's gonna be that. It's gonna be the pot the noodle the elbow macaroni noodles smothered in the sauce and that's you don't have to put a topping on it you don't have to bake it or anything like that that's just mac and cheese that's mac and cheese i agree um what i make is like you said mac and cheese casserole and it's it's fire it's delicious yeah it's good i don't use you make a roux yeah yeah. you make a flour roux you add your cheeses so what kind of cheese do you like to add i don't i like to use Three different cheeses because they all have little different flavors. Like, I agree. So you need you need first off you need cheeses that'll melt good, and always grade your own because they always put some kind of starch on those bag cheeses. I know they're easy. You, you can, taught me that. You can wash that starch off your cheese. I've seen people. Man, <laughs> have you ever washed cheese? <laughs> I know. Have you ever washed chicken? That's the two big things I get on TikTok. <laughs> that's like my pet peeves and people telling me I need to wash my chicken and wash my cheese. I'll grade it every time. I would much rather grade it because it's going to get mush. It's, yeah. it, and the only reason why you need to do it in the sauce is, so I mean, so it's smooth. It smooths out your sauce by using the cheese that'll melt really good. Mm-hmm. If you don't, it's going to be lumpy. The pieces aren't going to really melt. They're going to kind of hold together. Now, when you're making, you know, like the little sandwiches and topping a casserole or something like that, Omelette. I'll use bag yeah. cheese. I'll use bag cheese all the time for those. I'm not trying to get it smooth. I just want cheese. But... What, what's your take on that? Do you grade it for, like, general use? If I'm really concerned about a cheese being melting and, or creaming, like, pimento cheese, I'm not melting yeah. it, but I'm mixing it up with delicious blue plate mayonnaise. That's what I was going to That's a good time to talk about <laughs> our, our favorite mayonnaise blue plate. Because, so you taught me this. When you make, and my mom, when she made pimento cheese, she just used the bag stuff. Mm-hmm. We never never thought about it. And then. But it stays in its I little cheese squat. You know, formation. It yeah. doesn't like cream out. It, it doesn't mix with everything. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't gel. Yeah. Like when you make real pimento cheese, it should almost have a creaminess to it, mm-hmm. you know, that, and it's not like individual little pieces of cheese. It should just kind of go together. And it keeps that texture, you mm-hmm. know, and it's almost like you bite into the cheese instead yeah. of it just being a creamy, delicious spread. Yeah. And so when I'm making a cheese sauce, like for this mac and cheese, I grade my own so I don't get that starch mm-hmm. in it. And the sauce will get really smooth, but you can't just dump all that cheese in there at one time either. You start, like you said, with a roux. This is like a basic bechamel first. A little flour, a little butter. Is Cook that it. what a bechamel is? Yeah, it's just, just like a white sauce. A white sauce. Yeah. Yeah. It's just the, one of the basic butter, sauces. Butter, flour, milk. Yeah. Cream, yeah. Milk or cream, whatever you want to use. I mean, a lot of times they'll season it just a little bit, a little salt and pepper, maybe a pinch of nutmeg or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But anyway, that's a basic bechamel. And so you take it to a cheese sauce by go ahead and adding some cheese to it. And then that's what, so when I get it to that sauce stage, I'll add a handful of cheese at a time and I'll mix it up, mix it up. And then when it starts smoothing in, I'll add another hand and slowly do this. And you don't have your heat high or anything. It's not like it's super high heat. You're just keeping it low and keeping it moving and keeping it melting. And then I like to season it right at the end so I can taste it and see what it needs. Do you always use the same amount of cheese or is it like no, a, a measure with your heart type situation? It is. I mean, th- you can put too much cheese mm-hmm. and it I've just clobs it. up. You don't have a sauce. I wanted to keep that sauce like consistency. So like for me, for, for mac and cheese, I think it's perfect if you use like a sharp cheddar because you want that sharp bite and then use like a Gruyere. Something that's um, melts. Yeah, really, it, really it's well. a really good melted cheese. It has a nuttiness to it, so it gives you. It's not real deep, like a depth of cheese flavor. It's kind of mild. I'd say it's really mild. It just has a unique flavor. And then I like Jack Monterey Jack. It's a great melting cheese too. That's you know, it's not too sharp either. So it it just goes with it. You Those three Colby cheeses. Jack in this recipe. Yeah, Colby Jack. Gives, I mean, in Colby so Jack, funny. it's about like Monterey Jack, but it's uh, you could use either one. I use the Colby when I'm making mac and cheese because it has that 
yellow orange tint to it. Yeah. Because if you, I mean, if you don't, you'll have a real light colored mac and cheese just by using all white cheese. And you can't, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with a white mac and cheese. Mm -mm. But when I think of it, I usually think of the yellow mac and cheese like I had as a kid. And, you know, and I grew up, we, my mom never made like cheese sauces or anything like that. It was all no. like box. We got the box stuff. I perfected Kraft mac and cheese. I can make a mean box <laughs> yeah. of Kraft mac and cheese. I don't need those directions at all. Oh, yeah. In college, I'd make it in the microwave. <laughs> yeah. That was before they made Easy Mac. Yeah, that was before Easy Mac. It was just the old box. You, you used to get them like four for a buck. <laughs> I don't know what a box of mac and cheese costs now. Probably two or three dollars. I add. Is it wrong to eat a whole box of mac and cheese? No, it, as long as it's a meal. <laughs> <laughs> like, if that's your meal tonight. You that's know, that's your serving. Because I've, I've done it. <laughs> I've done it I love too. it, man. Have you ever ate a whole box, Tyler? I, I like making it for my kids because they don't eat that much. So I'll yeah. give them each like a scoop, you know, and then I just take what's ever left in the pen. Do you put a dollop of blue plate in it? I usually go sour cream. Yeah. Oh, I'll do both. But yeah, I'll do both. I'll have to try blue. But it gives it it gives it just a little tanginess. I mean, it's really it's really good. It, it'll it'll take a I can soup up a box of mac and mm -hmm. cheese and make little it taste really good. Little creamies. Yeah. yeah. A little extra butter, a little extra milk. You gotta Look, get it. I just throw right. in extra cheese too. Yeah, yeah. Don't just use the oh, don't just use the powdered stuff. I'm not a big fan of like American cheese slices. You know the ones you unwrap individually, and lay on it. but they are great mac and cheese. <laughs> Throw a couple of those slices in there. I tell they you which one. Good. I like that uh, the the white American cheese we get at Kroger, like the deli section. Yes, it melts so good in mac and cheese, and it's not too sharp or anything. It's just creamy kind of. I think that's what they use to make like queso, like real. It queso. is. That's like yeah the the. I don't know if it's real queso, but it's American Mexican yeah. restaurant queso. <laughs> yeah. But that's all it is, is the queso that we know and love. The queso we know and love. Yeah. So um what kind of noodles do you put in your mac and cheese? Usually I just buy the elbow macaroni noodle. I mean, you could use whatever you wanted, I guess, but to classic macaroni and cheese to me is elbow macaroni. I don't use the big giant ones. I like the big giant ones. Do you? I, I think the sauce gets in the inside of them and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know what it is. I'm. You like the regular one. I don't like too much noodles. Is that crazy that I don't like too much noodles in my mac and cheese? But you love a penne. I do. I do like penne noodles. But I wouldn't use them for mac and cheese. Although they probably wouldn't be bad. I don't know. Yeah. They're, they like would them. fill up good. Yeah. What if you made a mac and cheese out of manicotti? Like made a, it would be the giant <laughs> stuffed manicotti, manicotti with manicotti. It's the big tube noodle. Oh, okay. Stuffed it with <laughs> mac and cheese and covered it with cheese. <laughs> Sounds like a new recipe. Yeah. Um. So short ribs. Now, you you wanted to do a brisket mac. Go sit down. <laughs> I got a dog beside me. So you wanted to do a brisket mac and cheese. I did. That was my that was my you initial were thinking. thinking. And what happened? Um. You found some. <laughs> I found something better. I found something better. Well, I, I was thinking. So what could I do? I know I've seen people do like Bernie in mac and cheese or brisket mac and cheese. Yeah, that's a and lot of so, cooking for mac and cheese. It know? is. But this is like, this is something special. This ain't just like your weeknight dinner or something like that. You're not just going to throw down a brisket or some short ribs on a weekly. On a, you got a plan for that. Yeah. And so I was wanting something special. And short ribs, if you've never had them, um, it is one of the, the best parts of the cow that you can possibly eat when it's cooked right. You think so? I really do. Better than a ribeye? But way better than a ribeye. What? Okay. I I mean, so you think the big beef rib, which is what I, well, you yeah. you know you've seen me say it, the beef rib. The best way I could describe beef rib is like ribeye steak on a bone that's super tender, like brisket point, and it's because it's got so much marbling in it. It stays juicy the whole time. The meat. Is just succulent when it's cooked right. You know, you got to render it down. You got to do it slow. There's no hot and fast to this. It just takes time because it's really not a great cut. When you look at it, it was probably a cut that people didn't use a lot. You think they threw it away? Yeah, yeah. Or, you know, found something else, maybe trimmed everything off and ground it all. It's not something that was used a lot. But short ribs is a dish served in fancy restaurants. Like, it's a... I'm sure it's probably a Gordon Ramsay style. Yeah, 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 exactly. I mean, it's it, you know, I'm, I don't know. It's probably French or something like that, where they mm -hmm. figured out to braise it down and use it. And that's all I'm doing to it. I'm just adding the grill element by seasoning it up, getting it on a smoker, getting instead of browning it like in your Dutch oven or whatever kind of pot or you know or on the stove. Yeah, yeah. 
instead of doing that, I'm using the grill to get some of those flavors on it, some smoke, let it build a little bit of bark, start setting on the outside, and then I'm putting it in a braise. And so that's all it is, is braised short rib. So you could do this in the oven if you wanted to. And this braise, a, a traditional short rib braise is going to be more carrots and Beer wine pie. and yep. that kind of thing in the braise. You went, you said you were doing a barbecue, barbecue style. Barbecue style short rib. So I used my vinegar sauce in the wrap. Um, you know, I, I, some you threw some vegetables in a pan with some. Yeah, it, it had. I, I like butter. using some stuff. I mean, I, I didn't put. I don't think garlic I put and onion. carrots. Yeah, I just used mm-hmm. the garlic and onions. Kind of going more like if you were doing it for barbecue. Is kind of what I was thinking. I didn't want to get it too. Like I didn't want to add the wine. I didn't want to get it too fancy. Yeah. But still, you know. You wanted to have fancy. those barbecue. Yeah, flavors. I wanted to have the barbecue element. Like I smoked it. You know, kind of like a brisket, flavor wise. But man, it was good. It was really good. It just takes time. You've got to braise those down. So once I got all those short ribs with some decent color on them, I put a meat down in an aluminum pan, bone sticking up, and that's when I added all my beef. I added some beef broth. I added some vinegar sauce. I, I had my onions and stuff going, you know, to soften up some. And then you just add that to it and cover it up and let that joker roll. And you want them to be, they need to be 210, 212 internal. I mean, so you're taking it a while, and you really can't rush it. I mean, it's okay to cook it, you know, 300, 325. I probably wouldn't go much higher than that because you want a long cook because what cooking it at too high of a temperature is going to rush it through, and it's not going to give that fat time to liquefy. So, yeah, the meat's getting cooked, but it's not getting as tender as it possibly could by giving it time and letting all that collagen and that fat break down and just surround the meat and make it velvety. Because it should pretty much fall apart when you get it done. I mean, you want it to. This isn't something you're trying to slice with a knife. Like, you want that bone to spit out. Like, when you pick it up, the bone, uh uh-oh, bone's out. (laughs) And you pick it up in your hand, and all you have to do is just kind of use your fingertips and just kind of shred it by hand. It shreds a lot like beef cheek to me. That's that's what it's closest to, really, when it's cooking this preparation. Well, you know, when you do it, when I do the dino ribs – that's the same short rib. I just got them cut up into chunks, basically. And you cook those. Yeah, you cook three-bone rack or whatever, and you cook them, and you can slice them, and it's like ribeye steak on a bone kind of, but, you know, cooked succulently. Well, this is more like, I wouldn't say pot roast, but it would, you know, you kind of cook it like you would a pot roast, kind of. And then it has that beef cheek. And, you, and I'd use the same technique for doing beef cheeks. Just season them different, but you're smoke just them, cooking them. Smoke on them yeah, and braise, and then braise them. them down. And then when you shred them up, I don't even know if you could tell the difference between short ribs and cheek once it's all shredded. But cheeks would be a great, like, cheek smack and cheese. Ooh. That, that would, would be, be really good. That'd be good. Would you take it in a Mexican? Because typically you cook beef cheeks in, with the Mexican yeah. flavors. You could do, like, a Mexican-y mac and cheese. Maybe put some jalapenos in there. Well, Use that's some grande what, gringo. That'd I don't be know. a fusion right there. That is kind of a Because I don't think, like, and you know... South American or Latin America or Mexican cooking or whatever, they don't use pasta too much. Yeah, you could, it's more rice. You could, yeah. you could do it, you know what it would be good with over rice? Like how you do chicken, cheese, and rice. Ooh. You could do cheeks, cheese, and rice. <laughs> That's really and good. And that would be really, really good. We might need to make that might be Cinco de Mayo or something. <laughs> cheeks, cheese, and rice. Don't that sound good? Heck yeah. I would do that. You can put a poblano or something on there or put poblano peppers in there when you braise it. You know at the local Mexican restaurant, they call chicken, cheese, and rice the white girl special. <laughs> yeah. Well, this, this would be the fat boy special. <laughs> cheek, cheese, and rice. <laughs> Can you imagine that? The Just some really good, like, cilantro lime rice or something, and then make, like that, lime make lime. that American cheese queso, <laughs> and then do those beef cheeks like that and shred them over the top and then just drizzle all of it. And then put a little sauce. Just, Look, yeah, uh, yeah. Ooh. Oh, it would be so good. I'm down for that. Well, Mal, it's a good time right now for us to pay some bills. All right. The How to Barbecue Right podcast is brought to you by our friends at Primo Grills. Shell, did you know that Primo is the only ceramic grill made right here in the good old USA? What? Are you telling me that Primo Grills are proudly crafted here in the USA, ensuring top-notch quality and support for local craftsmanship? I sure am. Plus, Primo Grill not only delivers mouth-watering flavor, but because of their innovative oval design and superior ceramic construction, Primo Grills also gives you a ton of cooking versatility. Whether you're smoking low and slow or searing a steak to perfection, 
Primo Grills gives you the consistent heat distribution for mouth-watering results every time. What she said, y'all. Y'all visit primogrill.com and check them out. This past weekend, I made burrito tacos. I can say we made burrito tacos. I started the process and you kind of <laughs> finished it, commandeered it. Yeah. Uh, but we we did it the cheating way. Oh, yeah. Inside. In it was the, the super quick way. We had some sirloin tip. Was it sirloin tip roast that yeah. I had in the freezer? Yeah, yeah. And I was like, we need to use it. I don't want it to go bad. Um, so I thawed them out. Uh, then Sunday morning I woke up and I seared them in a pan. Did you season, season them? them? Yeah. What did you season it with? AP and Grande Gringo. And then I seared it in a pan to get that crust. Mm-hmm. So I want to talk to you about that. The browning of the meat. Is it important? Does it affect? I think it, actually. I think it gives it a little depth of flavor. I've done it both ways where I've made a roast or something like that, where I've just thrown it straight in the crock yeah. pot or roaster. We, we threw the arborias in the crock pot. I like, I like, I'd personally had rather brown it some or smoke it or grill it or do something just to get something going on the outside because you get those flavors. There's something about that reaction, that meat, that's really, really what's it, the Maillard reaction? Maillard. That's that browning of the meat, and you get those flavors going in it, and it gives it a depth. So as opposed to just putting raw meat in there and it just turning gray. We're getting some caramelization of the meat, I guess, or I don't know if it's caramelization. It's kind of browning, really, but that's what it does. I think. I think. I think. Yeah, it's necessary. I did uh, some research. Oh, <laughs> little learning, little learning corner time. So, do you remember Alton Brown did a show all about does searing seal in juices? In yeah, meat juices? Oh, vaguely. And he basically said that his experiment said it doesn't. If you're cooking meat, you're pushing moisture out, regardless. You know. Mm-hmm. The more you cook it, the more moisture you push out. So there's no sealing. There's no searing to seal it in. Yeah. yeah. I, or sealing. I, I, can, yeah. I can believe that. But the Maillard reaction actually does affect the flavor is what my research is. And what kind of what? Like the caramelized surface of the meat will give you a richer flavor and it adds color to the dish, which so, makes sense. Yeah. Um, browning or caramelizing meat before putting it into a slow cooker isn't necessary, but it's worth the effort. For flavor and a full-bodied end result. So if you wanted to taste better and look a little better, yeah, go ahead and brown it a little. And you do want a darker color most of the time when you're cooking yeah. roasts and stuff. So when you brown it, are, you're just talking about putting a little olive oil in the pan? Yes. And just letting it sit there until it starts developing some color, flipping it, trying to get all sides? And you're not worried about the doneness. Not at all. You just want to get it brown, but without burning it. Yeah, I'm just trying to get the color. I want a crust. I want it to get almost as dark as it can get before it burns and mm-hmm. then throw it in there. But one thing I did learn is water is an enemy to the Maillard reaction. So you want dry meat? As dry as you can get. Any residual moisture on the outside of a steak or anything will cause it to steam rather than sear. And that results in a crust that's far grayer and way less crisp. That goes to what I wanted to talk about here. I was just going to mention you you can't put too much meat in that pan or too much moisture will start coming out and it won't brown. All you'll get is gray because you end up with so much moisture. So you got to do it in batches whenever you're brown, depending on the size of pan. Mm-hmm. But you don't want to crowd that pan and start pulling out all this moisture and wonder why your meat's just turning gray and not browning. Well, it's because you got so much meat in there, the moisture's trying to come out fast and you're filling that pan up with a little, it might even be a quarter inch of water or you know meat, meat juice in the bottom. You can't sear. It won't do it. I've added too much oil to pans you, before, like yeah. searing chicken or something like that. So what do you, white. you, I'd say you just want about a tablespoon, just enough to slick the bottom of the pan. It's not like you're trying to fry in it at all. You're just trying to get a, co- a surface to where stuff won't stick as bad because <laughs> you want it. Now you want some stick. What's it called? The fond. You want that to build on the bottom because that gives you flavor in your dishes too. And even though, you're moving it to a crock pot. You deglaze that pan you used, and you add that liquid over to. I did not do that, but that's a really good idea. Oh, you could put a little beef broth in there, yes. or I mean, if you're doing something fancy, you know, you could put a little wine if you wanted to. But I usually use beef broth or chicken broth, and just let it deglaze and get up, and then add that to your dish, and you've got all that goodness in there. So much flavor. That that Maillard reaction really does give a a good flavor. Yeah, and a lot of it gets left in your pan. So what kind of pan did you use? Because I'm a oh. fan of 
the stainless. You know what kind of pan I use. Stainless. We have the same woods. Well, I didn't know. So <laughs> we have nonstick. We, we do, have we Dutch never oven. Use the yeah. I'm when I'm making something like that, brown and meat. I'm always using stainless. Why do you like stainless? Because it because because stuff because it browns stuff so well. It gives really good heat. You don't get any kind of off flavor from it. Like you know, you're cooking on on, on well, one it doesn't brown as well and and nonstick. So that's out. But if you use cast iron, it does leach some of the flavor from the cast iron to the dish. I hate cleaning the cast and I hate, iron. <laughs> yeah, I hate cleaning it like that. I mean, you could, but it's it's not ideal. Mm-hmm. Straight stainless is the way to go for it. And when you first bought that set of stainless cookware, it, it took you me a it. minute to learn how to cook on it. Because everything's stuck. But now I know. That you want some stickage. Right? Yeah, and I know how to get it up now. Yeah. It's not scrubbing. We don't scrub those pans. I basically put more water in it, let it get super hot, and just kind of. Yep. You're just deglazing every time. I just deglaze it every time. Every single time. Yeah. You turn that heat. Even when you get through cooking, get your meat out. I usually try to do it right when I get through cooking something. So if I'm cooking dinner and I've cooked in a stainless steel and I've deglazed, I made everything, you know, made my sauce or whatever. If I'm not making a sauce with that. Gree gree, I call it, or fine <laughs> in the bottom. I'll go ahead and add some water to it, let it deglaze, scrape it up, and then turn the heat off and just let it sit there until I get ready to clean dishes or, you know, help you clean dishes. <laughs> you don't help me clean dishes. I bring them to the sink. <laughs> I get everything. I do the pre washing because you don't like to pre wash. That just means you rinse everything off really, really good in the sink <laughs> with hot water, and then you goes to the dishwasher. Well, that's good. I appreciate that. <laughs> you didn't realize I did that every time? <laughs> you don't. <laughs> Um, but so my Bria, I bought a Bria sauce from Kroger. It just said Bria sauce. I it was in a jar. Private selection. It was a private I, I selection. I tasted it. I was skeptical. Well, this ain't going to have much flavor. It was pretty good. Yeah. For for as quick as it is to get going and not having to do all the stuff with the fresh vegetables. Now, I'm sure it's better. With oh, the, I'm sure it's way better. This was, I would use it. I'd use it again. So I've I, already got an idea to use it. I pulled up a couple of recipes on how to make Berea. Yeah. And it was the ingredient list was 50 strong. Yeah, <laughs> it was deep. And I was like, Ew. Yeah, it is. It's a lot goes into and it. And I saw Kroger had a sauce. I was like, you know what? We're, we're going to try that. So what did you think? I thought it was really good. At first, when we um, used it, I told you it had a nutmeggy cinnamony flavor mm-hmm. that I wasn't crazy about. But once we actually built the Berea and added the cheese, and it was. It was great. Yeah, you wouldn't want to eat it by the spoon. Yeah. It's a little strong. But once you get it cooked down in the meat and everything, it, it mixes in, and it makes a really, really good sauce. And, of course, we added other things. We had onions and garlic, and we mm. used grande gringo, and I a think little, we used some chili. bonafide, too. A little chili seasoning and in And some there. salt, because that's the one thing it needed that, that helped it the most was add more salt. It was kind of, until you get that salt just right, it wakes everything else up. And so that's when you really tasted the flavors. You could taste the peppers that was in the sauce and stuff, but it doesn't have the sodium. I didn't look to see what the sodium level was on that sauce, but it wasn't very high. Couldn't have been. Couldn't have been because it didn't have it didn't have a salt. You know, it didn't have that balance. It was just like a a pepper mash kind of you know sauce, a tomato sauce or something. It was better. Sure, it had tomatoes in it, but you didn't think tomato. It wasn't. It was a, more pepper. It was a darker, darker yeah. brownish color. Mm-hmm. But it went all pretty much. I bet it went seven hours, seven or eight hours in the crock in pot. the crock pot to get it as tender as it needed to be to shred. And then it just shredded like butter. We added it back to the sauce. You took some sauce and uh, food processed it. Yeah, I took some of it out, and because I like the when I do, I can't never say it right. Bria. Bria. I don't know if I'm saying yeah. it right. Bria. That's how I say it. Bria. That's how I say it too. Bria. But anyway, I took I like to have that to dip my taco, the consomme or whatever. So I took some out, ran it through a little uh, blender real fast. I did put it on the stove and get it because I like it to serve it really hot. You know, you want it warm when you're dipping your taco. And I did fortify it with a little bit more beef broth just to get it a little bit looser consistency. And it was to man, a good dipping good. consistency. Yeah, a good dipping consistency. But the rest of the sauce that we use with the meat, that's what you use for dipping your shell. And cooking it, and that's where you came in. Yeah, we dipped our shells. We took flour. I know you're supposed to do corn, but we do flour. We took our flour. Green go away. Yeah. Dipped it in the sauce, the leftover sauce. Put it on a flat top. Flipped it. Flipped it. Cheese, meat. 
cheese. That cheese that you bought for those was excellent. Chihuahua cheese, I think is the brand. I don't know. Yeah, it was something. It, it's some kind of special melting cheese. Mexican melting cheese yeah. is what it said. It, it melted. It was real cream. It, it reminded me of, it didn't have much flavor. It's kind of creamy. I just like mozzarella. Mm-hmm. It was like a Mexican mozzarella. You could use Jack. Jack would work too. But you make it. Like you put that cheese down. You put your good handful of the meat down. Close that shell. You cook it like a grilled cheese, <laughs> and it gets toasty and crunchy on the outside. Then you open it up, hit it with the cilantro and the chopped onion, and then dip it in the consomme. That's a fine taco. It was really good. So this weekend, I have a roast. Like just the kind you would do a traditional pot roast with. Like a chuck roast. Chuck roast. Is that what it is? A yeah. chuck roast? Okay. But instead of doing it a traditional, I was thinking about doing a uh, Mexican pot roast. Okay. Mexican flavors. Use grande gringo. Serve it over rice. I like that. What are your thoughts? I think it'd be really good. It'd be a lot like those tacos. You might not cook them. You might not cook them as cook that roast as far because you want it. You know, you want it to. You don't want it just to shred, shred like a taco shred. You want it to have like a pot roast. Yeah. Eat it with a fork or whatever. So with pot roast, I would throw in onion, celery, carrots Mm -hmm. while it cooks. So what would, what would you do with this one? I'd definitely put onion. Yeah, um, obviously. Definitely some peppers. I might put a can Garlic. of those. Chipotle. Ooh, peppers? Like green peppers and red peppers? Yeah, you could put those. You could put, I mean, you got to watch your heat level when you start doing that. But, I mean, garlic and onion are two that definitely would yeah. be good in it. I don't know about, I just don't see a lot of carrots and Mm-mm. celery. And I don't want Mexican the sweetness. Style dishes. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, carrots bring some sweetness to it. You could definitely you could put bell pepper and stuff like that if you want because they're mild. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. I can do. I could slice a bell pepper like a fajita bell pepper. style. Mm-hmm. Throw it in there. Crockpot fajitas is kind of what it would be. <laughs> Pretty much <laughs> is that what it is. I could see it being good. So I got a couple questions for you from the community. From the community. The Let's this Get one. to Cooking Facebook community. <laughs> This one I thought was an excellent question. Um, it's a could be a whole. We could talk about this for the whole podcast. What is the p- proper way to use mop sauces? Hot and fast cooks or low and slow? Do you use it at the beginning? Do you use it at the middle? Do you use it at the end? Do you use high acid mops? Sweet mops? What do you do? All the above. <laughs> <clears throat> that, I mean, that is a big topic because. I mean, I think what we is use a, mop? a I think a mop sauce is to you what's a mop? A, a barbecue based. mop. What, a a base. based of some sort. When I, when somebody says, Oh, I'm using a barbecue mop, oh you're just you, you just made up a base. And it could be it could be spritzing with water. It could be one of my favorites where I take the Italian dressing, mix it with some barbecue rub and some barbecue sauce and some more water. Give me and that it, recipe real quick. So what do you So do? I take And this is for pork, right? Yeah, I use it for pork. One bottle of like zesty Italian, but I usually strain it to get all the bits of garlic and pepper out of it to where I just have the flavored oil and vinegar. And then to that, I'll I'll take one bottle of that same size. It's usually 18 ounces, I think. Fill it up with hot, hot water. I'll pour it in there and I'll I'll start whisking in one cup of barbecue rub. Um, To one bottle, I might use just half a cup. Yeah, because usually I do a three-bottle batch and I use a whole cup. You probably don't measure either. And I don't. (laughs) But I usually add like... Tablespoon of soy sauce, tablespoon of Worcestershire sauce, and that's it. It's that simple. Mix that up and use it with a mop. Now, often I would buy those old stick mops and use those, and that's what I would mop with. And it's great for basting ribs, basting pork butts. Um, It's good on chicken. It's not really my thing on beef. I don't don't know why. I just don't like putting that oil in this on beef. But uh, some some people mop beef. Um, but that's and that's where we see it used a lot is a brisket mop. Like people will say, "I'm using a brisket mop," but what they're not telling you is they're not usually putting that on the outside of the brisket while it cooks. It's going in the wrap, so it's really like a wrap juice. It's not really a mop, but you see it often called brisket mop. But that's how I mean. And any time that I mean, it could be a vinaigrette, it could be it could be whatever you want. It could it be sweet? You have to watch sugar content when you're using any kind of mop or baste because if you're putting this on on the meat as it's cooking and you're still trying to get your you know smoke into it and it's got a long way to go you're going to burn if it's sweet that sugar is going to caramelize and that's going to turn your stuff dark so that's why you don't see me putting a lot a lot of sweetness 
That's kind of your and end, your glaze. Yeah, yeah. You glaze with the sweetness. Gla- glaze with the sweetness. Use your vinegars, bowl of water to to mop or baste with. You when you were talking about I forgot uh, in my recipe that I had a barbecue sauce too. Like a cup of barbecue sauce. In your mop? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. That was kind of in comps I would do that. At home it would just be the oil and water and rub and soy and shire. But in comps I'd always add a little barbecue sauce. But I was watching it and I wasn't letting it get too dark. We were wrapping as soon as it started getting dark. If you're you know, if you're not really paying attention, you can, you know, get it too dark because of the sugar content. When you were talking about you don't really like to mop <clears throat> briskets, so I'm picturing in my head, you know, have I ever seen anybody actually mop briskets? I haven't, but I've seen them spritz them a lot. Yeah. The, like most of the time it's just keeping some moisture on it because with that brisket, we're trying to get that dark crust. And so you, you need it to, to dry in places, but brisket's cooking out moisture, but then you don't want it to dry too much. So that's why you come back and spritz <laughs> it. So if it's got dry spots, you can just spritz the spots that's dry. So it's a fine line. But if you put, if you're constantly mopping brisket, it's it's never going to get that right crust. So you, you got to get it. You got to let it dry as it cooks. You just don't want it to too dry. So you spritz it, then you tip it? Spritz it, and you tip it, and get all the standing <laughs> water off. Yeah, you're just keeping the top moist. But, you know, you and you can use mops whenever you want. Um, usually the whole thing is you don't want to – you only want to add on when stuff's drying out because the goal of it is to add more moisture. But by, by putting stuff in the mop, and using different ingredients, you're adding flavor while you're adding that moisture to keep it from getting too dry. So that's what the mop does. So if you start mopping too soon? Yeah, you'll wash off what season you have on there. There's no use in doing it. So you have to let that meat begin to cook and need to be mopped before you ever use it. So does it matter if you're cooking hot and fast or low and slow? It doesn't really matter. You could use it in any application. I would say if you're cooking hot and fast, you're going to have to mop it more often. Low and slow, not so much. But it really depends on the pit too, like how much airflow is moving through that pit. Is it really drying it out, or do you have like a, a a pit where it's got a water pan or something that's really keeping keeping the humidity up inside the cook chamber? Because then you don't have to baste or mop near as much. What if because the humidity's right, it's not really drying the meat out. What if it's really humid outside? Does that? Um, I never really paid that close attention. Like if it's, I mean, it it. It's, if it's humid outside, it can change. The humidity and barometric pressure and all that really does change the way things cooks because it has different air going in your smoker that's doing stuff to your fire. You know, you're getting that cool air in, it's cooling it, your heat might not be as much, but it's more about the airflow in the pit that drives the meat out as opposed to, to the humidity outside. I'm no meteorologist. I don't understand all that stuff. But basically, your mop is a tool to prevent the meat from getting dried out. Yeah, and to add flavor. And to add a little flavor in the process. That's what it does. But it can hinder crust from forming well, and it, bark from cre- being created. If you, if you put too much of it on, if you're, wa- if you're doing it too early and you're washing some of your season off with it, a lot of times when I mop, I don't even touch the meat. I just dip my mop and then kind of shower it over the top or dab it a little because I don't. I never want to brush it because it'll um, it, it'll take your seasoning off. It can, and I don't want to do that. I just want to add some moisture to it. So, do you still prefer those old school stick? I don't use them at all. Mops. I don't. I don't. I never really mop that much anymore. If anything, I do. I use my big orange pump up sprayer, and I might you know I might mix up. And I've got another one I mix up where I use red wine vinegar, some pineapple juice because I like the the what is it, the bromine that's bromine, in pineapple juice? Yeah. It's like an enzyme that helps tenderize meat a little bit. I'll add a bit, a little bit of that, and it does have some sweetness to it. So you're going to get a little bit more caramelization, and then I'll add some water. And sometimes I'll even put a little olive oil or some kind of oil in it, and it just makes like a quick little vinaigrette marinade. And I'll spray that, but I don't use it a ton. I I like I like the bark, so I'm a real. I want a crust. I want that flavor on the outside. I, I don't want it to over dry, you know, dry out and stuff, but I'm like right on that verge because I really like that flavor as, as opposed to a sweet, saucy flavor on my stuff when I'm eating it for my for myself or even for you. I mean, I think you kind of swayed me that way because that's the way you liked your barbecue. You didn't want all the glazes and the and the sweet stuff all over. No. You want to taste the meat. So that, that got me to thinking I don't have to do – so much to it you know a lot of times we're overdoing it 
that comes from my comp background. Yeah. Jazz everything up to 11. <laughs> you know, you got to take it over the top to to win. But and really, really, you don't. And it's really good when y'all do all that. It's really good, but it's really good for a bite. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I get it because eating barbecue, you know, you, you don't you don't need all that extra. You just want to eat the meat that's really been smoked and cooked right. It's all technique on how you cooked it. So um, someone wanted you to clarify the amount of broth. To in your gumbo recipe, I feel like we've talked about your gumbo recipe a lot. Yeah, do you even know? <laughs> well, it's kind of a labor of love, but I would say I usually use three to four boxes. Oh wow! At least three, at least three quarts. But you buy four boxes when? But I always buy four just in case I need some. Yeah. yeah, but you could also add water if you needed to because you you know you fortified it enough with flavor. If you've got one of I've those. used I've used two and a and a quart of water. You know, or how much ever really depends on your pot, how I'm, how I'm trying to get it. I mean, my roux is going to thicken it up, so it's not going to be too runny. But um, I never make it like it depends on where I'm at, where I'm making gumbo. If I'm making it at, at camp at smokehouse, I, I have certain pots down there I use. If I'm making it at home, I've only got a certain pot, and I don't know if they're the same size. And I just go, I buy four, and that's what I use. And I may not use it all, but. I don't have. I need to write it down. I don't have that recipe wrote down. Mm-mm. It's like something I know how to do, but I don't have a recipe for it. So I need to. I need to take the time and do that recipe and write it down, so people can duplicate it. Yeah, because there's a lot of stuff that I cook that I don't have recipes for. You ask me how do you cook this? I don't know. I just cook it. You can tell me. Yeah, I can tell you how to cook it. Yeah, but it ain't can't like yeah. give me a direction. When I think about it, it's like one of those things. Oh, I know, or I can look at it. Oh, it needs more. I need some more juice. It needs more moisture. And I feel like you can kind of fudge that a little bit. Like if you add it a little much, let it reduce. You know, yeah, cook it down. <laughs> That's right. That's right. If you need a little more. Add some water. If you need a little more flavor, if the water you know took if the flavor, if you got it too salty or something, add yeah. a little water. Just turn it down a little bit. But you can always add that um, beef concentrate or chicken concentrate yeah. to get you your flavors up with the water. But usually it's a cup of flour, a cup of oil, three to four quarts of broth or liquid. That's the ratio. That's pretty standard for a gumbo, I would say. I don't always max it out because I like my gumbo to have a little body. I don't want it too runny. Yeah. I'm with you. I want to be able to dip my bread in it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're not talking. Stand up. Sp- we're not talking spoon stand up. I mean, it's not. Yeah, like it ain't that. mashed potatoes. Yeah, but it's it does have a a mouthfeel to it where you know you're eating that and not soup. <laughs> to me, that's that's kind of the difference in soup and gumbo. Soup's kind of runnier. It gumbo, have the gumbo has a, yeah, gumbo has the thickening agents. So I thought this was a great question. Are grill grates worth it if you have a pellet smoker? Uh, yeah, if you want to sear steaks. My answer really? was, it depends on your pellet smoker. Yeah, that's probably true, too. Yours only goes up to 350 It's probably not going to Yeah, it's going to make that much of a difference. I don't know. Those grill grates do carry a little bit higher temp. We, I mean. They'll concentrate it. Yeah. The way they radiate it, and when they're heat up right over that deflector shield, you can you can get some really good heat out of them. And I've even, some, some of the pellet grills, they have, like, the little door or the little hatch you can open up. To get to the fire pot, and if you got grill grates over that, it's just like being on a fire over a regular grill. So yeah, they work. So I would say not a must, but they're nice for cooking steaks. Um, you know, you you can actually get some sear on them, and you can heat them up, and they'll hold it. And they do better. Like when you first put them on, and you sear a steak, you're probably gonna say, "Man, this ain't." It didn't really do much. Well, it's because those those grates haven't been really seasoned and cooked on. The more you cook on them, the better they're gonna get seasoned. So the grill grates need to be seasoned? Yeah. Yeah, I want mine what, seasoned. What does seasoning do? I, I guess it just kind of builds up that little layer on them like it does a cast iron pan to where they always want to cook right. You know, at first they're just metal. I'm, You know, so you got to get the little oil on them and cook that oil on them and get that surface right, and that's what heats up, and that's what gives you those good marks. Now I'm not talking about gunked up from seasoning and, you know, fat drippings and all that stuff. It's just cooking on it. How do you clean your grill grates? Get them hot and scrape them. I mean, there ain't no, I don't soak them or I don't rub on them too hard. Usually I clean them right after I'm cooking by getting that, letting that open that grill up, letting them get super hot and then getting that brush tool that comes with them or a wood scraper and just scraping them down. Even some aluminum foil we'll hit them with 
but by keeping them old, cooking on them, keeping them old, and scraping stuff off, it'll they'll be seasoned after a few cooks. It's a lot like seasoning that you know you got to season your black stones or your Weber griddle flat yeah. irons or whatever they're called. You, you got to season your cast iron. You got to you got to season your cast iron. You got you know it's got to be broken. You get seasoned smokers when I first cook on them. You just you know cut them on right out of the box and go to cooking on them. There's, it's not going to be as good a flavor as doing that burn in and you know getting the cooking off everything that's on there from. The, so what is a burn in? It's where the first where you get that grill hot, but what really what it's doing is cooking off any kind of oil that might have been a residue that may have been left on there from the manufacturing. That's why, that's why, but I, I mean, you should do it with every pit. Just burn anything off that might be on there. Even if you make a homemade one, you never know. You might have left, left some stuff in it. So you wash it down, try to get it clean, and then spray it with some cooking spray and heat it up real good. That's seasoning the pit. And just let it run for? Let it run for a couple hours, yeah. Most most pellet grills to have a burn-in or break-in period. Oh, they do? They'll tell you, like, you run them at this temperature for so long. Then raise it up and run it at this temperature for so long, and then you can to step it back down and shut it off, and then you're ready to go cooking. Instead of just turning it on and filling it up with meat and rolling, you, know, <laughs> you got to burn some of that stuff off. I'm kind of hoping you were willing to cook a steak for dinner tonight. I'm fixing to go rolling. <laughs> after, I get, if I, after I get through throwing a few strikes, I may cook a steak. Depends on how the beers are tasting at the bowling alley. <laughs> That they got cold middle right there. I bet they do. I bet they do. You might be the first one to buy one. I think we're going early, but we are fixing it. Oh, uh, two employee, o'clock. Employee Appreciation Day. It's Employee Appreciation. You know, it's Friday. National Employee Appreciation. Oh, I didn't Day. know that. Yeah, really well, is, well. Tyler, Jacob, I appreciate you guys. <laughs> Thank you. So we're Let's going take you bowling. bowling today. We're going lunch and bowling. Heck yeah. Where are we going to lunch? Georgia Blue. Okay, I've it's never a been chain, there. but I've never been. Never been either. Yeah, I'm, sounds interesting. Have you looked at their menu? Uh, no, I haven't. I don't know what is it bar food or <laughs> they got a little bit of everything, right? I think it's like an O'Charlie's or. Okay. Yeah, he said just like a bar. So. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, they have a bar. Pre-game. <laughs> <laughs> That's all, that was that was the trigger word there. I mean, the only uh, other options to take for lunch are what? What what's up there? There's a Corky's. <laughs> I'm sure Actually, I ate pizza. Corky's last night. Oh, How did you? Corky's? Yeah, it was. Did you get the catfish? Uh, my wife did. So, like, hey, it's right. Their catfish is good at Corky's. I couldn't get Ashley to eat there for like a long time when we first moved here because I have always loved their pulled pork baked potato. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I would go there all the time, take the kids and stuff. And she was just, I don't know, she would never try it because I guess she's a barbecue snob now that I work here. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys sent home too much good stuff. But she went out with her friends to a movie, and Corky's was the closest. I think restaurant nearby or something mm-hmm. like that. So the I was, parking lot. I was like, I know they have really good catfish. Like I was like, you know, we've met the guy that is kind of over Corky's and stuff. He's always talking about the catfish to so get the catfish. She tried the catfish sandwich and she was like, man, this is too good. It is. It is. So now she wants to go all the time. <laughs> it is good. Their it, barbecue's pretty good. We can't. Michael he protests. Their he will not go to sauce Corky's. is trash. That's why <laughs> he likes sauce and he hates Corky sauce. I don't hate it. Hey, I used to, that used to be part of the burn ass chicken. <laughs> I would buy the big jug of Corky's at Sam's. So, what's the burn ass <clears throat> chicken was your competition chicken recipe for backyard? Yeah, comp- for backyard ancillary Yeah, It was Corky sauce. You take chicken thighs, yeah. marinate them in zesty Italian that dressing. It. Just, the, just that, nothing else. Pretty much frozen chicken thighs. I, you know where I get them? Aldi. <laughs> I would buy the frozen, but I was, I didn't have no money. I didn't have nothing. You know, it was, we were barely doing good to go cook. So I was trying to budget every dime. So I'd go to Aldi and buy me the bag of chicken thighs, froze, dump two bottles of like Kroger, the cheap, or maybe Aldi zesty Italian. Into the bag. Yeah. I'd, I'd put them, yeah. Usually, but I'd put it down a Ziploc bag because that bag always leaks. I don't know. They, it's got holes all in it. <laughs> <laughs> but so they go in a Ziploc bag and then just throw them in the beer cooler or whatever cooler I had, meat or whatever in at the time you know we didn't care and then they'd sit in there for a day like just be italian soaked up <laughs> you take them out of there and you threw some number five or whatever kind of seasoning we number had back five, then flavor aid flavor rama <laughs> flavor rama that's yeah. what it was flavor rama number five would go on them and then they'd go on the hottest weber i could get the whole time just pounding mls <laughs> 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 burning the chicken it's 
And then I'd have a, a jug of the gallon jug of the corkies and I'd throw it in a pan and get it warm. And nothing else? You didn't season the corkies? No. Or anything? No, nothing. I'd take them burnt thighs and put them in that sauce and just wash, wall them around good. And then I would I would take care to do this. You throw them back on that grill, but a lot of times my charcoal doesn't get to where it's burning out by then. And so I put them back on there and just flip them and flip them until it starts caramelizing and charring. First place. <laughs> All the time. All the time. And I think it's because you didn't care. You were just burning chicken. <laughs> I think it's because it was thighs. And they stayed juicy. And they stayed juicy. Yeah. And everybody was turning like, in. Like, what is this? What have they done to this chicken? It's good old school. Like when you were it didn't talking, didn't taste about- nothing like chicken. <laughs> <laughs> it tastes like Thai like bar- dressing, barbecue, and caramelized sauce. When you're talking about mopping, so keep falling. Um, when you're talking about mopping, you 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 have done that chicken before. Where you load up the grill, yeah. and just mop on the sauce with mm-hmm. that old school. Yeah, mop I have done that too, and just let it bake on, and it just layers on and layers on. I love that chicken. That's like some old school barbecue chicken there. When you That's do how that, how my daddy used to cook it. Yeah. Leg quarters, and just mop it like that, and then just keep flipping it and mopping it. It's like it. something about that that's good, man. And the chicken, the skin is not the best, but it's delicious. It's not. It's not going to be like a yeah. crispy bite through skin. But see, I figured out how to do that. Those leg quarters and get them crispy on the pellet grill, and they are they are fire. Now they're not the same as that baked on, keep tossing on, you know, flipping and turning, turning burn chicken like what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. It's just, but it, you can get those leg crispy leg quarters on the pellet grill. They how do you do good. it? Just high, like we do wings. You go. You got to. You got to rank. Uh, crank that temp up three seventy five, four hundred. You can cook a leg quarter in about an hour and ten minutes, and they are they're juicy. Cook fully the outside skin as long as you get it dry, and then season it. it and you know, I usually spray a little cooking spray on it, season it, and then that'll kind of fry that skin a little bit, so it gets crispy like we do wings on a pellet grill. You had one recipe where you used a a spicy Mississippi is what you called it, spicy Mississippi chicken. But it was like a real coarse rub seasoning that you mixed yeah. up, and you coated that chicken in it, and then we served it with white sauce. It was good. It was really good. So Mark, so I gave Mark the rest of that seasoning, and he loved it. He's like, man, if you don't bottle this, I'm going to. And he thought it was great. <laughs> it was just some stuff up there together. What did I call that? Mississippi chicken or something? Yeah, like that? spicy Mississippi chicken. And it was just chicken quarters, and I think you did it exactly that way. I think you put it on the pellet yeah, grill yeah, and let it, it get was, crispy. It I need to cook that again. It's time to eat that. That sounds good right now. Do you think that pellet grills are the best way to get crispy chicken skin? Have you found any other way? I mean, by, besides frying them? Besides frying them. <laughs> Grilling yeah. and smoking. Yeah, yeah. I would think so, other than, like, it's hard. that's hard to do on, like, a regular smoker or a regular grill, like a Weber grill or something. Uh, pellet grill. And the what happens is it's moving so much air to keep that grill that hot. That it's kind of dehydrating. That it's skin. air frying it. It's air fry. Yeah, it's kind of. Like, it is. It's kind of like an air fryer. It really is. At four hundred degrees, man, you're. It's rocking. You think it gets it crispier than doing like that bacon soda? Yeah, you know I've done that and it works. But I, there's a fine line between that mealy texture it gets because you can easily get too much of that stuff on the skin. I, th- I think just letting it sit in the air dry makes more difference than anything. Getting Letting the skin air dry as much as possible before you put it on the pit, it really helps. It, and it really air dries the best in the refrigerator because I guess your refrigerator is moving there and you don't realize it or something's different about the air in it. But Because you just set chicken on a rack in the refrigerator, not on top of each other, spaced out, it'll dry that skin pretty quick. It's also probably not letting it like warm up, which yeah. brings moisture to the surface. Yeah. But the problem is remembering to pull your chicken out. In time. In time to let it fully dry before you cook it. That's right. Because most people are taking that chicken out of the big, because it comes in like, when you buy leg quarters, it's usually the cheap bag. Same thing I'm talking about, like the Audi bag. There'll be five or six leg quarters jammed off in there. You may have to do some trimming on them. Oh, yeah. Not. You might get a backbone up yeah. in there. Now, you know when you say wash chicken, that's the one chicken that I typically wash. What, bag chicken? Bag leg quarters. <laughs> <laughs> For some reason, I don't know what they do to those. It's just cut it off and throw it in the bag it seems like <laughs> but i do always wash those because you always have to trim on them some they don't like when you get that i mean these aren't like the fancy ones these are the leg quarters that are usually 
forty nine cents a pound yeah. or whatever. Yeah. You, you can get a bag of them for three bucks. I cooked a lot of these back in the days. I was I was broke, <laughs> yeah. and so that's what we would do on Friday night. We'd buy the twelve pack of cheapest beer we could afford and a bag of chicken quarters, and we'd have, best. have a party. We're smoking on the patio <laughs> of an apartment. <laughs> this was like <laughs> this is like college time. We're barbecuing. You got some nasty yeah. old leg quarters and a, what kind of grill? Oh, it was Richie's. Like it was one of them old. I don't know what brand it was, but it's like the side chamber with the side fire, you know, a side fire box, you, smoke chamber. Are you talking about when you lived over? Yeah, the church light. Yeah. No, what, what, what are those called? I forget what apartments those were called. But they're by the hospital. When I knew you? Yeah, yeah, yeah you know me. You don't remember when we'd cook chicken out yeah. there? Me and Richie would always be cooking chicken. Y'all usually had one night a week. I was perfecting my skills. <laughs> you didn't even know it. <laughs> you just thought we were drunks. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you were practicing you for your know, future, career. My future career. Future <laughs> career. You, you too. Can have a career in barbecue. <laughs> Buy you some chicken thighs and some beer. Make it a weekly routine. Well, Tyler, what's going on in the community? Have we got anything giveaways coming up or anything? Yeah, we'll have a giveaway coming up really, really soon. So y'all have, make sure to head on. Oh, over Easter's to- right around the corner. We got to have a giveaway for Easter. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking something with that white sauce and couple other things so we're gonna we're gonna flesh all those details out but it'll be up real soon it's gonna be on facebook.com forward slash group forward slash h2q community it's really an awesome place to hang out i know all of us are always in the comments and then there's tons of other people that are like-minded uh yeah. grillers that are all in the comments and sharing recipes and stuff like that so it's really just an awesome place to oh, kind of hang out on facebook so. it's where we get a lot of like i love when people ask questions because it's where we get a lot of topics a lot of things to talk about on the podcast yeah. what what when you think of easter what food do you think of? Ham. Do you? I, I kind of think eggs. of deviled eggs. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> deviled eggs. Well, because of Easter eggs. I think of deviled eggs. That'd be a good one. Like, let everybody send in the piss, pics of their deviled eggs or whatever. You got a Ooh, that's egg a recipe. good one. That is a good uh, one. I did one the other day. It's going to be a, I think it's going to be a TikTok or something. We'll see how it turns yeah, out. Yeah, Cajun. It was a really good deviled egg. The filling was really good in it. Cajun deviled eggs. We'll talk about that later. I okay. had to have some questions about that. But. All right. Well, Shell, what else you got today? That's all I have. We uh, Spring break's coming up. Easter's coming early this year. We've got a lot of stuff going on. But Heck yeah. We're already into March. It's the first day of March. I can't believe it's March already. Two months down. Spring break's coming. But that's all I have for you today, Malcolm. It's time for you to go get your... I gotta go You're stretch. Yeah, I gotta go get my stretching <laughs> in. Get warmed up a little. You think they'll let me throw a few frames before we start counting them? Yeah, yeah. I suck at bowling. <laughs> <laughs> I want you I'm talking about the worst. You kind of look like you would like, be good at bowling. Yeah. Though. Yeah, maybe at one time. <laughs> I was in a hey, I was in a bowling league. <laughs> I could We had shirts and everything. I was the weak link. <laughs> <laughs> I would join a bowling league. I would do, I would be the guy that I could tote. I think it was four pitchers of beer in each hand. <laughs> yeah. So four? I would, yeah, I could buy the handles. I could get four, and I, so I would go to the beer, you know, the little concession stand, and get the beer and bring back. I, I think that's the only reason why they had me because I was entertaining. <laughs> You're the hype man. I was like, yeah, we're gonna give him the beer. You're in charge of the fifty cent beer because it's like fifty. You could, a pitcher of beer was dirt cheap too. I, th- I think they were like. Four dollar pictures or something back then. This is now. This is you know yeah, a while ago. Back then, before two thousand. I remember they used to. Have, <laughs> that's that's crazy when you think about it. Before 2000. before two thousand. I remember when they had quarter uh, draft beers. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, hey. worst hangover ever. Oh man, I forget six one six. They used to do dime. We would go there on Thursdays for dime beers. Take you a dollar do, and you were ready. <laughs> do you ever do drinking with Lincoln where they'd sell quarter penny pitchers? No, we never had that. It was like a Monday. Dimes the cheapest. I mean, I think Silky's was fifty cent draft, but those were the days. Fifty cent draft. It was like milk. The oh, warmest it's the worst. Milwaukee's beast yeah. they could sell them. It was the worst. You could tell it had been refrigerated, and they were just trying to clean out and cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now everybody just gets excited for dollar margaritas at Applebee's. So. Do they have those? <laughs> I think so. Oh, I think man, I didn't know that. Do they? What? I'm gonna have to start <laughs> going back to Applebee's. Yeah. Got that one in Senatovia. Barber Street Steak. <laughs> Well, Matt, that's all I have for you today. All right. Well, we appreciate everybody hanging out with us today. We will be back next week. To do we come back next week? Yep. Spring break? No, it's not. Okay. Spring breaks in two weeks. Okay. But we'll be back then. Yeah. Too.
Well, we'll be back next week. <laughs> Thanks for listening. We'll see y'all next time. Uh, what was I supposed to say here? If you'd like to connect <laughs> with Malcolm, it's How to BBQ Ride on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Twitter, TikTok, and of course YouTube. If you'd like to connect with me, it's Miss Southern Shell on Instagram and TikTok. All right. Well, we gone. <laughs>